Hey, what's up, guys? Drew here, thatanxietyguy.com. How many times has Holly heard me say that? Many now. <laughs> what's up, Holly? Back with Holly, live from Majorca. Is it beautiful? Hey. Uh, it's, it's beautiful, yeah. It's, it's early in the morning here, and it's freaking freezing, so enjoy the warm weather. You're sitting outside. I hear birds. Like, come on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's pretty nice. If you're quiet here, you'll hear the heater that I have running in my office because it's so goddamn cold. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stand it. <laughs> so today we are going to talk to a different group of people. So if you usually watch us because you're dealing with panic and anxiety and agoraphobia and all that stuff, go make yourself a pot of tea or something and get your husband or wife or mom or dad or best friend or whoever is important in your life and tell them to come watch this video because we're going to talk to them. Yeah, this isn't for you. Yeah. I mean, it is watch along with them, you know, and fist pump when we say good stuff that you like. But uh, but this is a video for people who are living with and have relationships with and are, uh, you know, have close relationships or friends with people who have anxiety disorders, panic disorder, agoraphobia, you know, recurring panic attacks, OCD, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to talk to you. So if that's your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your partner, your best Parents. friend, your parent your sister, your sibling, whoever, if there's somebody close to you in your life that is dealing with these issues, then this, we're going to talk to you and what the best way that you can approach this and what you can do for that person and with, with that person more so. Yeah. Than for, and just right? to, to, to tell them, because they may not know, hello, these people, uh, Drew and right. I both suffered from, from these things, uh, you know, big, big time. <laughs> and now we are recovered and we don't anymore. Correct. So, and, yeah. So that we make great. these videos and we try and help people through recovery of anxiety disorders and panic disorder and agoraphobia and all that. Yeah. And now we're trying to say it to you, the people around them, because that's a kind of big, big deal as well. It is. So, so the people that we address all the time often have this topic that they want to talk about. So the effect of the disorder on, on their relationships, a marriage or friendships or whatever. Um, so it is a big topic. And, and I think, uh, so Holly's correct. We've both been down this road um, for quite a while, and we've both been in the pits of it and the worst of it, and now we're both living very normal lives and, and trying to help people out. So I, I think the first thing I'd want to say to people who are watching, who are dealing with somebody who has an anxiety disorder, um, crippling panic attacks, won't leave the house, keeps canceling plans, can't go to dinner, has eight zillion different restrictions on how they have to do things so that they're safe, can only go out with you, or don't want to be left alone, all these things, right? So we're not talking about just somebody who's anxious about their career. This is somebody who has an anxiety disorder. Oh, yeah. yeah, we should talk for at least a couple of minutes on on what it is and what it isn't. Like the popular misconception or the, the popular thing in the West, like, oh, I saw a commercial for antidepressant on TV. So just go to your doctor and, and get a pill and it'll all be better. So we should probably talk about the whole cognitive and behavioral thing. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so here, so here's the deal. Significant other, friend, whoever you happen to be watching, and thanks for watching, by the way. It's, you're doing a good thing. Like an anxiety disorder is a cognitive and learning problem. These are bad brain habits that your person has gotten into over the years, and it's essentially like a phobia, right? So. Like yeah. if you get if you get bit by a dog, you could instantly develop a phobia of dogs. Yeah. And so when you have if your you first have panic, panic attack, attack yeah. what happens? It, yeah. Yeah, it's like it's because it's so intensely scary because and you know it like literally is sort of like fear distilled like chemically through your body to make you like it makes you feel like the most scared you've ever been, but you don't know what you're even scared of. Mm -hmm. um, and it's such a scary thing to go through that you never want to go through it again, that you develop a, a phobia of it, of it happening again. And that right. is panic disorder in its simplest form. Right? Correct. So many, many people, in fact, if you're watching, you may have had a panic attack or two in your life, just that for you, you never developed the, the anxiety disorder. So yeah, a panic attack is about the scariest thing you can encounter without actually being in danger because you yeah. aren't this person, you know, this person is really okay, but they don't know that they, that fear is every bit as real to them as if they were having an actual heart attack or a stroke, or they were dying or, or going insane. Or if somebody held, was holding a gun to their head, that fear is every bit as real to them. And it is real fear. It's just, it's just triggered at the wrong time. It's essentially the fight or flight response triggered at the wrong time. Yeah. 
And it's such a bad experience that this person begins to fear the next time it happens. And that's when it becomes a disorder. So all the, the hallmarks, when, where, when was your first panic attack? Let's talk about that for a second. Do you remember where it happened? Yeah, I was just at home. I was 11 years old and I was at home watching TV with my parents in the evening in November and just out of nowhere <laughs> had a panic attack. And yeah. yeah, it was just the worst thing that had ever happened. And I didn't know what it was or what was happening. Or I mean, I just you just feel like you're dying and going mad and just it's just yeah. Yeah. It's, it's horrible. It's just insanely awful. Yeah, it, it is horrible. So we'll use terms like that. We always tell the actual sufferer, like, stop saying it's horrible. Like, yeah. we always say that to them. But to you, if you're watching yeah, your husband or whoever. Us, we all know already. Yeah. Right, exactly. But, I mean, it is a horrible experience. It's an experience nobody would ever choose to go through. Especially when you don't know what it is. When, when it first comes and you don't know what it is. And no one even, you never knew what a panic attack was or that this is what it is that's happening to you. It is, like, it is really, really scary. The, yeah. And the fact that it sort of can come out of the blue like that, it's just, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's really difficult to go through. And so it's yeah. such a bad experience that many people and some people have a panic attack and just go on with their lives. And we don't know why one person does and another one doesn't. We don't know that. But what we do know is that some people have that first panic attack and immediately begin to worry about it happening again. So my guess is that, you know, usually one of two things, either you sort of don't care, but then it happens the second time and now you care. Or even the first time it happens, you start to worry that it will happen again. Yeah. And when you start, I know you talked about struggles with being in school. So the way it develops into lifestyle modification is wherever those symptoms of panic hit, you start to become afraid of being in those situations. So if it happens while you're in the car, you don't want to drive the car anymore. If it happens while you're in the supermarket, you do not want to go to the supermarket anymore. You had issues with school, I would imagine, when you were young, correct? Yeah, because, I mean, when it happened to me, it, it sort of seemed so intense. And I was so young and <clears throat> didn't really understand anything. And it appeared to me like I had a panic attack that lasted nine months. Obviously, I didn't because it's physically right. impossible. But... <clears throat> I was just in this heightened state of like, you know, very frequent panic attacks. So I couldn't go to like, I mean, I, just the idea, I couldn't leave my house, you know, I could, right. but I didn't. Right. Like, right. Yeah. And, so I didn't go to school and I was so worried. My, my big fear was that people would see me having a panic attack because I was sort of like freaking out and crying and, you know, like grabbing my face and, yeah. you know, I appeared like I was insane. Right. But so I didn't want anyone to see me like that. So I just stayed in the house, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and didn't leave. And and that's, couldn't... that's the natural progression. So a, a panic attack is that fight or flight response triggered at the wrong time. It's incredibly scary, even though you, there's no reason to be scared. That's true. And you know that. You know that your husband or wife is okay, but they don't know that at the time. And then the disorder happens when you become afraid of the next one. And panic disorder can... Then you start to modify your lifestyle. So like Holly said, she didn't want to leave the house because for various reasons, some people don't want to leave the house or can't go into certain situations or can't do it alone because they're afraid. They're still afraid of those feelings and they believe the danger to still be real. That's why I'm saying it's a cognitive and a learning problem. It's not a body problem. It's a mind problem. So they yeah. still interpret those issues. They still interpret their heart pounding or sweating or feeling a little dizzy as actually dangerous. And yeah. Right. And so one of the most common things that, you know, you'll hear them say, it felt like it feels like I'm going, I almost did this. I almost passed out. It felt like I was going to die. It felt like I was going crazy. Yeah. And meanwhile, for the, for you, the significant other, the friend who doesn't have this problem, you're saying like, no, you're, you're not going to die. You're not, you didn't pass out. You're not going to pass out. You never pass yeah. out. You're just having a panic attack. <laughs> right. Right. And, and that makes sense because that's rational and that's correct. But to the person who is actually experiencing these panic attacks or these heightened states of anxiety, it's they they will avoid those situations and their world starts to get smaller and smaller and they start to modify things and avoid more and more and more and refuse to do things or require that you be with them to keep them what they think is safe. So a recurring yeah, theme say, is the safe person. Yeah, yeah. the safe person. That's the the big safe one. Person. I would say there's a few branches that people go down. One is that like they, their world gets smaller because maybe like me, it was probably more like a social anxiety, like right. sort of social anxiety base where I didn't want people to see me 
having such a bad time, you know? Mm -hmm. So I could stay at home and, and I, was, I was having panic attacks wherever I was. There wasn't certain triggers for me. It was just like all the time or yeah. whatever or randomly. Right. But I would feel better at home because then at least no one would see me like <clears throat> freaking out, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> and then for other people, when they feel the symptoms that they have like a health anxiety and they're convinced that it's not just a panic attack, that it's actually something that they're having a heart attack or they're going to have a seizure or a stroke or, you know, right. they're going to pass out or whatever. So they think that there's something really wrong with them. And so it makes them more scared and, you yes. know, and then they go down that route. And then the other one is that like people have triggers that sort of cause their panic and they're so scared of how they feel when they panic that they just try and avoid all of the triggers yes and sometimes i mean to me it was probably like a combination of all of them as well it is it is but you know like they're the sort of like main sort of branches i would say i might be missing some but like no so that, then that's then about right the and so like oh, i don't want to go so that's why you sometimes get like the safe person as well because like maybe they were on their own when they had a panic attack and so they think that if they're with someone then they'll be okay or, yeah. or that if they're worried that they're gonna have a seat like a heart attack at least if someone's with them they can take them to the hospital and you know this correct. kind of stuff. correct and, and i think that's why the safe person or that and that's why it's such a, a strange myriad of we see people who can't leave the house or people who only want to leave the house people who develop the strangest safe zones, if you will. So people with advanced panic disorder that starts to lead to things like agoraphobia, which can also lead to something called monophobia, where that person yeah. is afraid to be alone. Um, it's all based on being afraid of something they don't need to be afraid of. And either you're afraid that you're going to look foolish while this is happening, like Holly's issue was primarily. My issue was the being afraid of how it felt. Like I thought I really needed help or rescuing. Like yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to need an ambulance. I'm going to need a, an ER. I'm going to I'm going to die. Like the most common fears that come along with a panic attack are death and and mental incapacitation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like I'm either going to die or literally go insane. Like the person literally thinks they're going to go insane. My uncle used to have it when he was younger and he wouldn't be left in a room by himself when he was having a panic attack because he was so scared that he would disappear. And that no one would be able to see him and they'd all be sort of like talking and he'd be like, I'm here, I'm here. And they'd be like, oh, where is he? So I mean, it's, it's so stupid. But I know. Like, to him, that was like a real. That was a real fear. fear. Yeah. I mean, I have. And believe me. So this is something I have been doing this. I've been podcasting on this for four or five years now. And and before that, spent many, many years interacting online with people who deal with this. And I have heard many. I've heard the best one ever. And, but these are real. So if you're watching this because you, your husband or wife or someone important to you is dealing with this, like this is real. I actually interacted with somebody years ago whose fear was that gravity would stop working. That, oh, my God. And that That's was, yes, like how far out there is that? And if you're watching it now, and we could look as rational people, and even most people with panic disorder and agoraphobia would say, okay, that is way out there. But to this person, that was a very real fear. That's, it was as real to them as like, uh oh, I might, you know, stub my toe or I might I might get a cold or the flu. Like we all would think we can get the flu. That's a that's a possible thing that can happen. This person truly had themselves convinced that, well, gravity could turn off and what will happen? Like we'll all we'll all die. So yeah. like there's a, there's an obsessional component to the anxiety complex. Usually some form of OCD comes along with it, whether it's irrational, obsessive, intrusive thoughts that fuel this avoidance and safety behaviors, or there's a bunch of stuff. And honestly, your person might not, as good as your relationship might be, might not even be telling you all the stuff that they're yeah. thinking and afraid of. Because it, uh, in their rational moments, they understand like, oh boy, I can't tell anybody this. This is too far out there. So Holly's uncle was afraid that he would disappear. And, and I, I knew a woman who was afraid that gravity was going to turn off. So this is real. This is, this is a real thing. So, and, and I think just to sum that up, because we've spent 15 minutes on what it is, and I think that's super important, yeah. like, um, to sum it up, like, the, this is that thing where the person is afraid of how they feel and what they think. So the approach, the most effective approach we know of is not to try and stop them from feeling it and thinking it. Like, which is the, the traditional way that we do it in the West, which is you go to your doctor and he or she gives you a pill, a tranquilizer to calm you down and an antidepressant. And they tell you, you have a chemical imbalance. And in the end, that is no more effective. And it comes with a slew of problems and side effects as the behavioral and cognitive approach that we're talking about here. Like yeah. it is by far, hands down, 
no question, mountains and mountains of decades of evidence that the cognitive behavioral approach to this is the best approach, longest lasting, best, no side effects. But as we're going to talk about now, your person has to do some very hard work. Really so hard that, work. Yeah. yeah. And scary has to do things that are intentionally very scary for them. So let's move on to yeah. like, well, how do you but deal with this? So yeah, yeah, let me just explain the, the cognitive behavioral thing is that yes. so the just quickly the idea is that thinking, feeling and behaviors are all interlinked and they all kind of affect each other. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very hard to say to someone like, well, just stop feeling scared because you just can't really just change the way you feel about something like that. And it's very difficult even to change your thoughts quickly, you know, like, so we'll just stop thinking those things. But what is very easy to change is your behaviors, easy to a degree, you know, right, right. So your behaviors, the things you actually do. And so the idea is that if you change the way the things you do when you are anxious, mm -hmm. you in turn, it affects your over time, it in turn, like affects the, the way you feel and the way you, you think about stuff. And so that's how sort of like the uh the approach really goes is that, yeah. by, that those three things sort of affect each other and it's very hard to just change your feelings and change your thinking but you can change your behavior so. that's true so like the the basis of it is when when your person i'm going to keep calling them your person when your husband wife or whoever your friend when they're feeling okay reasonably okay and rational they can work on how do I change my thinking? Let me look at those thought patterns, learn to identify the negative thoughts or the triggering thoughts and understand what they are. And they can think rationally and work rationally through the thinking part. But when the shit hits the fan for, you know, in, in plain English, all that goes out the window. And now the best you could do is learn to not react the way you've always reacted. So the, the best way to do that is if you have a phobia of dogs, I think people understand this. Like if you were trying to get over a phobia of dogs, you would you would probably sit down when you're feeling good and learn about dogs and learn how safe they are and learn, you know, their social interactions and what makes them okay and how to identify an aggressive dog. You would do all that studying part. But yeah. when you get in a room with a dog, you lose it. You freak out. And the only way that you can get over that fear is to stop freaking out. To just yeah. be calm and like in a methodical way, begin to get closer <laughs> and closer like, to that dog. Yeah. Right. Dog or get closer to the dog. Yeah. Correct. So this is all about like learning the thought things and working on that, but also slowly and methodically actually going into the situations that you've learned to be afraid of so that you can learn that you don't need to be afraid of them. There you go. Yeah. Worked. Yeah. <laughs> you prop the phone up on your coffee cup. <laughs> 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 so, um, yeah, so that's the cognitive behavioral model that says you, you start to work on changing your thoughts and your behaviors and your reaction to the fear. So the number one thing we're going we're gonna to say to you right now is understand that this person, their job is now to go directly into the fear instead of running from it and to surrender to it and not fight it because Should they must explain why. Yeah. And I think that's that experiential learning thing that says the only way to not be afraid of a panic attack is to let it do the worst thing that that person thinks it's going to do so that their brain literally learns through experience which is the best way that we learn as human beings that it didn't happen. And then you do that again and again and again. And it, and over time the brain understands like, Oh, that is really uncomfortable and I don't like it, but I don't have to be afraid of it. Yeah. Because what's yeah. really important for everyone to realize is that the person suffering anxiety, every time they react with fear to their mm -hmm. panic attack, to their anxiety, to the thoughts that they're having, they are all they're doing is feeding the, the anxiety even more because the adrenaline works in the way that so the, your body's like flooding with adrenaline to make you able to physically like run or, or, or fight or whatever because it mm -hmm. thinks that you're like a literal like physical danger. It's like from the old like caveman sort of like days. Right, right. And so because but because it's being triggered at the wrong time and so they're feeling all this and it makes you feel kind of weird you know as if like because it, it cuts off blood to your stomach and it puts more blood into your muscles and you mm -hmm. know so you can feel shaky and sweaty all those symptoms that you get and it can make you feel really like weird and like out of yourself and all <clears throat> every time you react with fear to that like oh my god I feel awful this is awful because it, 
your brain like says like, oh, you're really, really scared. You must therefore like fear must equal danger because you wouldn't be scared if you weren't in danger. So mm-hmm. you must still be in danger. So I'm going to keep sending you adrenaline. I'm going to keep you in this like in this response so that you can definitely get away from the danger. Of course, the more it sends you and the more you like react with fear to it, the more it keeps sending. And that's like the, the fear cycle that we all get mm-hmm. trapped into. That's true. And so we are keep it like the person suffering is keeping themselves stuck by reacting every single time they're reacting with fear and what they have to have to have to do is break that cycle and right. not be scared of it and that's the bit where it's hard like well just don't be scared of it like yeah okay. right right yeah it sounds easy to say that's exactly right and and so as the rational person like the the, the person who doesn't have panic the husband the wife whoever you are Yes, it's super easy to just say, oh, that sounds so easy. Just don't be afraid. But it's it doesn't work that way. So the way your person has to do this is when those feelings hit, they have to actually do the, the exact opposite. So yeah. this is almost always about doing the opposite of what they want to do. Like they want to run. They want to call for help. They want to distract themselves. They want to fight and tense and push it away yeah. and try and stop and, and, and sit there and, and go, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, and argue with the irrational, crazy thoughts that they're having. But that's not what you do because that says – when I do these things, when I snap a rubber band or drink water or, or eat mints or, or they call you for help and want to talk, please help me. I'm having a panic attack. Please talk to me. When they do that, they are actually reinforcing the mistaken belief that that phone call saved them from some horrible fate, but it didn't. Yeah. So yeah. the person has to understand that even if they did nothing but lay still and breathe all alone in the middle of the desert on a boat in the middle of the ocean, they would still be okay. They need to learn that, and they only learn that through experience and letting the worst thing happen because it doesn't happen. So yeah. this is what they this is the process that they have to go through. And so, like, how do you? Let me just a little programming note while we're at it. So Holly, we didn't plan this out so well. We're 22 minutes into this. Maybe this has to be multiple videos. We've okay. talked a lot about what it is and the mechanics, which I think people need to understand. So now this would be the what you do as the person around the person. <laughs> right. So like this is what it is. This is what this person is going through. This is what it, it's not a go get a pill. It's not a ghost to the doctor. It's not a eat more. It's not stop drinking coffee. It's not any of these things. It's this is a learning and cognitive thing. And the person has to start going into fear to learn experientially that they don't have to be afraid. And maybe the next video has to be like, OK, and then what what should you be doing? Because this is yeah, going to get okay. super long. All right. So so that's fine. So stick with us. We'll, we'll wrap this one up, I think. And then we'll do another one maybe right away if you have the time on, okay. on how. Yeah. On how. So people don't have to watch an hour worth of video. So um, so now that we know what the person has to do, which is crazy hard, crazy, crazy hard. Yeah. They have to do the opposite of what they want to do. They want to go into the fear instead of avoiding and away from the fear. And they In manageable ha- steps, it must Right. Be. Thank you. Well. Yeah, why don't you why don't you expound on that a little bit? Because I think that's important to say. Like, it's yeah, not like you can't just now be like, oh, well, you haven't left the house in six months, so like, but you have to go into the fear. So come on, into the car. Let's go down the shopping mall. Like, no, 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 no. That's way too much. It has to be in small, small, manageable steps. Correct. Um, as it just it like it, it's called flooding, right? And it just mm-hmm. has like the opposite sort of right. It, that, it that's exactly right. Out. Yeah. And so I think, you know, the, the other thing that we should add to that is even when and, and your husband, wife, whoever it is, they may have just stumbled upon this because most people don't they don't think they don't even know about this. They just know they have this thing. They think it's an external problem. It's a mental illness. It's this thing happening to them. Yeah. And, and it's not. It's really not. And it's and it's cured, cured. I will use the word cure. But people get over this millions and millions and millions of people all over the world get over this every year. Every year, like it's happening right now. There are people who used to have crippling agoraphobia that are living normal lives. You're seeing two of them right now. So, so small manageable steps is one thing. And you have to understand this is new to them. Maybe like I have to do what I have to actually walk down the block by myself. Like that seems crazy to them or incredibly scary. Or like, why would you make me do that? Cause it's like, they're being asked to walk into actual danger. They don't understand yet. Possibly that they're, they're not like nobody's asking them to do anything actually dangerous. Um, so they have to get their brain around that task, I think, and understand that has to be broken into manageable pieces. And the one thing, 
you know, maybe segueing into what the next video is going to be that you always have to remember is that the person is experiencing as as every the fear that they are experiencing is every bit as real as you would experience in the scariest possible situation you can imagine. Right. Yes. So if, if you have never had a panic attack or you've had them, but they're no big deal and you don't have agoraphobia, but your wife does or your husband or your sister does or whoever in your life, just imagine suddenly finding yourself where your chest hurts and you can't breathe and you are having a what you are convinced is a fatal heart attack as an example. Like, how would that make you feel? That is how your husband, wife, sister, brother, friend feels when this happens. Um, oh, so like there's a gun being pulled on them. Like, yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly how they feel. So if you take anything away from this, it's that that fear is real, yet it's an irrational fear and it needs to be uncovered as such. So it's not a quick fix. It's not a pull yourself together. All the things we yeah. hear people say. But, but it is completely recoverable I don't yes. think that's a word, but whatever the word is it yeah. is it is completely and utterly recoverable i think and if you look at this problem that your your special person is having as a bad brain habit as opposed to continually looking for what can you swallow what can you change in your diet you just I, and we've heard all of these things you just need some fresh air you just you need to get out you need to have a few beers you need to have like we've heard all of these things oh you're eating too much sugar sugar is poison it's giving you anxiety no you got to abandon all of those things that is not what this is i mean will caffeine yeah. make somebody a little bit jittery sure it will but I, it's not too much caffeine that's causing this problem. This is not a body problem. The body thing is just the symptom of the problem. So that's what it is. Do you think we missed anything trying to explain what's going on? Because I think for a lot of significant others and fans, friends and family, like this is new information. They would have never thought of it this way. It's, yeah, we hear this know. all the time. Yeah. Like, yeah, my husband, my wife just doesn't understand, thinks I should just get it together. Like, why can't I just do what I have to do? Well, this is why they can't do what they have to do. Yeah. So this what we're going to be asking you to do is like a weird middle ground between between being very understanding and sympathetic, but being like quite hard and and, you know, helpful yeah. as opposed yeah. to like coddling and enabling the anxiety, which is a lot of the time what ends up happening. Correct. Or the either people end up enabling by being like too helpful to do like doing what the people ask them to do for them all the time. Yeah. And that actually just enables their anxiety or they're just like too harsh and like too distant and cold and just go, pull yourself together, you, you stupid person, because there's nothing there, you know. And it's right. just like we're going to ask you somewhere in the, the like there's a, a middle ground that's very, very uh, good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think in this second video um, that we're going to do, what, that's exactly what we do. We're going to kind of teach you how to toe that line between yeah. supportive. But really what you're going to be is you're going to become a cheerleader. And you're going to yeah. become a source of inspiration. You're actually going to become a model for that person. Because we often tell these people who suffer with this, like, just let your husband or wife, don't be angry that he wants you to go to dinner. Let him model that behavior for you. So, yeah. you know, yeah. so you will become a model. You will become a cheerleader. You'll become a supporter. Sometimes you're a shoulder to cry on, but sometimes you're a, it's okay. Like, remember what this is. Remember what's going on here. And I know, remember what you have to do and go do it. And I'll be here waiting for you when you get back. And you know, I'll root you on. That's what you're going to become more than anything else. So, and well, we'll bring it on the next Sorry, video. It's not cool. Did, I don't know if it's like, Oh no, 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 you were fine. I didn't even notice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I think the other thing we'll talk about, maybe we'll just talk about the next video is what, what your special person's responsibility is in this. They have a responsibility too. So uh, they have to acknowledge that these are bad brain habits and they're not really sick and, they, and that they can fix it. And if they can acknowledge that, take responsibility and commit to doing the work, then you have to become a cheerleader and a supporter and on all of those things in a special kind of way. So we'll talk about that in part two. Yes. Yes. Awesome. All right. So um, thanks for watching. Uh, it sounds so weird because we're just going to go right into part two, probably. <laughs> but we'll assume that you're watching at some other time. Who knows? Um, and I guess if you want to know more, I mean, if you're watching with your whoever this person is in your life, they've already found us. So they know the Facebook group and they know my website and they know all that stuff. So just just see what they've been, you know, watch some videos with them and see what they're going through. We really, I think they'd really appreciate it. They really would. Yeah. So yeah, definitely. All right, cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks for stopping in. We'll see you on the next the next version of this. Hang in there. Bye. Bye. Hit the stop recording. Awkward stop recording.